U.S. Navy history arriving. Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I'm Dale, and Steven's over there. He's the XO, fresh off a of captain's mast. Hey there, everyone. So apparently, you aren't supposed to pretend to be the captain when the captain's off duty. Fun fact. Yes, enjoy your half pay reduction and your confinement to the ship for 30 days. Hey, you know what? I have everything I need right here in my quarters. Oh, and you're not sleeping in your quarters for the 30 days. What? Yeah, you're in a hammock in the bilge. This is an outrage? Why, it's a punishment. I don't like this one bit. Well, today we're going to start on the Patriot War. That that sounds like a weird, weird name. Like, is this against a, a rebel cell that wanted to make a new, better America, or...? This is a conflict between the UK, Canada, the US, versus a secret association called the Hunter's Lodge who had a membership of between 40 and 160,000, mostly Americans. This happened across the northeastern states, which were in support of the 1837 rebellions in the upper and lower Canada. Why do I feel like this is the origin story for a comic book villain? This was a grassroots militia that threatened British rule. It is the largest deployment of American troops against their own citizens since the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. And yet, I'm sure many of our listeners have never heard of this, because this is a new one for me. Let, let's see what the uh, secret hunter people were up to. Let's get underway. So this starts with the Mackenzie's Republic of Canada. There was an initial rebellion in Upper Canada... And that ended quickly with the Battle of Montgomery's Tavern. A lot of the rebels fled to the United States, and Mackenzie established a short-lived Republic of Canada on Navy Island in the Nigeria River. And then a little while later, he withdrew from armed conflict. And even before the battle a large meeting of men in Buffalo met on December 5th in 1837 and appointed a committee of 13 people to organize support for the rebels. McKinsey arrives December 11th in Buffalo and is met by Thomas Jefferson Sutherland, who was the major organizer of Patriot support for Mackenzie at Navy Island. He convinces Russellender von Russellender to become commander-in-chief of the Patriot forces. Now, von Russellender was a West Point graduate and had fought with Bolivar in South America. Wouldn't this constitute treason? I feel like this would constitute treason. Well, this is Canada right now, so it's not treason. Ah. You said Buffalo, I assume New York. Yes. Oh, okay, so they fell back to United States territory, but they, their aims were still Canadian. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. So they went to Navy Island December 13th and found 24 men to go with them. Now, Navy Island is in Canadian waters, which meant that they could not be implicated by the U.S. in military actions. So this just became a false flag up. I don't know if it's false flag, but they're trading very carefully. And they're operating under their own decisions. Like, they're not under any sort of orders from superior officers, Congress, anything. Oh, no, this is a rebellion. It's a militia. Right. Yeah, this has nothing to do with the U.S. government. Now, these guys were supposed to launch an attack in support of the... Duncombe uprising in the London district. And Mackenzie declared that the provisional government of the Republic of Canada. 
300 acres of government land was offered to each of his volunteers. So over December, large meetings were held in towns all along the border, including Burlington, Albany, Rochester, and Buffalo, Cleveland, and Detroit, and they promised aid. And by the end of December, he had 500 volunteers. Now, Duncombe's revolt failed. So that meant the main purpose of seizing Navy Island was now gone. And it was evacuated January 14th, which ended that little republic that they made. So December 29th, the steamship Caroline, which was captained by Gilman Appleby, carried supplies between Buffalo and Mackenzie's encampment on Navy Island. And on December 29th, and Colonel Sir Alan McNabb and Captain Andrew Drew of the Royal Navy crossed the international boundary and seized the Caroline, chasing off her crew, setting her on fire, and casting her adrift over Niagara Falls. Huh. They killed a black American named Amos Dufresne, which sparks a international outcry. The case was finally disposed by the U.S. Secretary of State Daniel Webster and Alexander Baring, and this led to negotiations to the Webster-Ashburn Treaty of 1842. So, so far, this sounds like a... Not that this is run-of-the-mill, but this sounds like a run-of-the-mill, disgruntled folks decide to take up arms utterly fail because they don't really have the organization or the numbers cause an international incident in the process call it a day so when does this become a you know tens if not over a hundred thousand folks in open revolt against the british government and american government because right now it sounds like it's just a few hundred that's when the Hunter's Lodge is formed. Oh. Still the same year. Okay. But we have some things leading up to that, of course. All right. The international incident was actually caused by UK, not the uprisers. Okay. So January 8th in 1838, Thomas Jefferson Sutherland was sent by the rebellion leaders to raise a force in Detroit. He finds Harry S. Handy and Dr. Edward A. Feller already holding a public meeting or public meetings to organize a invasion force. Handy was in Toronto in the fall of 1837, where he met Marshal Bidwell and learned of the rebellion from him. Handy and his brother-in-law, Judge Orange Butler, joins GM Dufort of Montreal, and they travel to Detroit, where they formed a war council of, quote, influential citizens. They were pandering to the rich folk. I was going to say, this, this sounds like it's just a bunch of buddies who want to play weekend warrior, and then were given way too many fun toys and lofty aspirations. Now, they were able to get men as far away as Illinois, Kentucky to come join their little movement. And on January 5th, the they raided the Detroit jail and seized 450 muskets that were being stored there. And it was reported that they also stole another 200 weapons from a office of the U.S. Marshal in Detroit, more than likely with help, though, from the inside. At this point, James M. Wilson is appointed Major General, Eliza Jackson Roberts as Brigadier General, Dr. Edward Alexander Theller as a Brigadier General, and he was in charge of the Irish and French troops that they were trying to raise. Irish and French immigrants, or like they were trying to go over the Atlantic with this movement now. French and Irish that were there. Okay, okay. Now, Sutherland and General 
E.J. Roberts, they had a disagreement of who was going to actually lead this invasion force on a schooner Ann against Fort Madison. Now, Handy appoints Feller to command the schooner Ann, and Sutherland would lead a flotilla to Boys Black Island, which was opposite Amherstburg on the understanding that he was under Robert's command. And for some reason, Sutherland stopped in American territory on Sugar Island. So the Anne attacks Fort Madison on the 9th and was beached. And Feller was taken prisoner and jailed in the Citadel in Quebec City. And of course, further attempts to attack Fort Madison was stopped by American troops. A series of attacks that were supposed to happen at the exact same time was set for Washington's birthday. Oh, what, what a nice present. Yeah, and they were the next ones to be planned. They missed doing it on his birthday. His birthday's the 22nd of February. So on the 23rd, the steamboat Erie was heading for Fighting Island, which is seven miles south of Detroit, and it was carrying about 400 troops from Cleveland under a General Donald McLeod. They, of course, were poorly equipped because most of their weapons were captured by American authorities. And the British, they sent their troops across the ice and they made them disperse. Two days later. Two days after that, General Von Resslner led 1,500 men from Watertown in Jefferson County, New York, to seize Hickory Island from Kingston. However, there was a rivalry between McKenzie and Von Rustler, and that pretty much drove all their men away. They were like, oh, screw these guys. They're fighting amongst themselves, and we're not fighting for them. Yeah, exactly. They can't even get along. Uh, March 3rd, most of the men later reformed at Sandusky Bay in Ohio. They were reformed under the leadership of Captain George Von Ressler, who is a relative of the general. And General Sutherland also took command as well. These guys take Pelly Island in Lake Erie. But their arms that they were expecting to get were again captured by U.S. authorities leaving only 200 guns for 1,500 men. Well, you guys will just have to learn how to share. Also, you might want to find new smugglers. So the British attack, and the captain and three of his men were killed. Oh, no. Now, the British, they did receive 30 casualties, mixture of dead and wounded, but the patriots, they retreat and were forced to surrender those 200 guns to the U.S. authorities, and they were ordered to disband. So this caused General Ressler von Ressler and William McKenzie to start butting heads. Blaming each other for failing? Yeah, and both of them were arrested for breach of the American neutrality laws, or treason. Sutherland was captured by the British near Detroit and taken to jail in Toronto, where he saw the hanging of Samuel Lamont, who was a organizer of the attack on Toronto. So a committee consisting of General Donald McLeod, William Lyon McKenzie, and Dr. Charles Decombe, Dr. Alexander McKenzie, and a number of other Canadian refugees they meet at Lockport and form the Canadian Refugee Relief Association. Dr. McKenzie becomes the president. Mick Lloyd, he became the general organizer. And this organization was connected very loosely with the attack on the steamer Sir Robert Peel and a raid on Short Hill. These guys just love to keep on making up new clubs. Yeah. 
The steamer incident happened on May 29th. The Patriots disguised themselves as Indians and attacked the steamer at Wells Island and burned it. I mean, if it worked in Boston Harbor, I, I suppose it could work again. Yeah, but that was for tea. This was just to burn. Oh, oh, there was no objective aside from, you know, light it up, light it up. Yeah, it was just lighting it up. And the raid was done by 24 mostly Canadian men. They assembled at Clark's Point near Lewingston, New York on June 11th and crossed over the Niagara River. They hoped to provoke a uprising of sympathizers in the area. So they attacked troops stationed at a tavern in Short Hills on the 20th and no, these guys were captured. These guys suck. Like, they're just bad. Well, most uprisings suck at the very beginning. They gotta learn. <laughs> so, Harry S. Handy, he was a lawyer, newspaper editor, and military engineer. He was appointed to oversee the construction of the Chicago Harbor in 1833 by the Army Corps of Engineers. Right. He organizes the lodges of the Secret Order of the Sons of Liberty and appoints himself as commander-in-chief of the Patriot Army of the Northwest and plans for a revolutionary army of 20,000 to capture Windsor on July 4th. The Secret Order of the Sons of Liberty is going to merge with the Hunter's Lodges, and that's going to be their big boost of numbers. So... The Hunter's Lodge. The first one was formed in North Vermont by Dr. Robert Nelson early in 1838. And it spread rapidly within Quebec. So in the summer, Donald McLeod was initiated in the Brother Hunters and informed them of the existence of the secret order of the Sons of Liberty. There was a third organization forming in Cleveland under Dr. DeCombe and was planning a invasion of Upper Canada. And McLeod, he had a little bit of influence and he convinced the Cleveland group to come into the Hunter's Lodge. The Sons of Liberty disappeared after a failed raid on Windsor and were pretty much just absorbed by the Hunter's Lodge. And that is how the Hunter's Lodge is formed. It's modeled on the Masonic Lodges, and they adopted similar secret signs, hierarchical orders and rituals. The Grand Lodge was in Cleveland, where DeCombe promoted it a hell of a lot. He was like, come join us. We are the Hunter's Lodge. We are awesome. We are a secret. Don't tell anybody. Are you sick and tired of wearing lambskins? Come join the Hunter's Lodge. We have deer stalker caps. Would you like to have a gun instead of a sword if you're keeping watch for meetings? Come join us. So, of course, as with any secret lodge, there are degrees of membership. There's four. Snowshoe, Beaver, Grand Hunter, and Patriot Hunter. That last one has concerning implications. <laughs> so, soldiers who had no rank were snowshoes. Okay. Commissioned officers were beavers. Field officers were grand hunters. And the highest ranking commissioned officers were patriot hunters. So, here is their provisional Canadian Republican government that they forms, that they form. After 160 delegates attend a week-long secret Patriot Congress in Cleveland. You know, for being secret, we seem to know an awful lot about this. <laughs> <laughs> so they had seven positions that they filled. The president was A.D. Smith. He was the chief justice of the peace in Cleveland. Vice President, Colonel Nathan Williams, a grocer in Cleveland. Secretary of the Treasury, 
Judge John Grant Jr., Oswego. Secretary of War, Donald McLeod. Commander-in-Chief of the Patriot Army of the West, Lucius V. Burris, who was a lawyer in Akron. Commodore of the Patriot Navy on Lake Erie, Gilman Appleby, who was the former captain of the Caroline. Remember the Caroline? That was set afire and thrown over the falls? Yeah. Yeah. He's... He's back. Com- Commodore of the... Pa- yeah, he's Commodore of the Patriot Navy on Lake Erie. And there was also a Commodore of the Patriot Navy on Lake Ontario. Because they needed both of those lakes. Yeah. He was Bill Johnston. I'm just imagining some of these guys going back to their day jobs and getting flack from their copers. One of these days, man... One of these days, (laughs) you're going to feel the wrath of my pent-up frustration. Oh, yeah, what are you going to do? Send an army after me? Oh, you have no idea. (laughs) (sighs) So they had a couple battles. Here's the Battle of the Windmill. This happened November 13th to 18th in 1838. There were two lodges in Eastern and Western divisions, and they agreed that they would launch a invasion of Canada on the 1st of November. Just these two lodges. This wasn't organized with the rest of the Hunter's Lodge. Well, it's the Eastern and Western divisions. Um, That might only be the Eastern and Western divisions. Oh, okay. So it, it was the whole organization. It wasn't just two local lodges saying, you know what, we're going to stick it to the Canadians. Well, I mean, the lodges, they existed in Vermont, New York, Ohio, Michigan. So, western states, west divisions, eastern states, eastern divisions. I can't get more specific because there is no more specific information on it. All right, well, any current The Hunter's Lodge members, I know you're out there. I know we're showing up on your radar because, you know, we're, we're speaking of the society that is not to be spoken of. If you'd be so kind as to reach out to us with the annals and histories of your, I'm going to say great, simply to stroke your ego, organization, we'd love those details. He wants to be an honorary member. Oh, no, 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 not really. I don't look good in snowshoes or in a beaver cap. Oh, I know you want to be a beaver. I don't want to be a beaver. So, the Eastern Division begins their attack on Quebec on November 3rd, under the direction of the Grand Lodges in Montreal and St. Albans in Vermont. The Western Divisions, under the command of Vice President of the Provisional Government, which was, do you remember? If you want to be a member of this this lodge, you have to know... This information. Oh, no, no, no. I've already left one secret society. I, I, I couldn't possibly join a second. The Grocer? I, I, Nathan Williams? I knew it was the Grocer, but I couldn't remember his name because it's just so hilarious that a Grocer has this position. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember the names. I just remember their day jobs. Well, he planned an attack on Detroit. But, but he... <sighs> but Major General John Ward Burge convinced them to attack Prescott on the St. Lawrence River instead. Yeah, that seems like a more simple target to, you know, break in your little militia. And the leader of this attack? Niles Stavolsky von Schultz, a Polish soldier who had been part of the Polish rebellion. So at least they have experienced rebellion leadership. Um, On November 11th, 400 men boarded a steamboat called the United States at Sackett's Harbor in New York. And, of course, disagreements arise. Of course they do. Between, yeah, between Burge and Von Schultz on the attack plan. And Burge takes 200 men to Ogdensburg for reinforcements. That never appeared. Now, Von Schultz and 150 men were aboard the Charlotte of Toronto and reached Windmill Point near Prescott on the 12th, where they set up camp. So the British and American troops, they 
stop the supplies to Woodmill Point. And Canadian hunters who had come in to support them were forced to withdraw. So the standoff ended November 16th when artillery pieces were brought in from Kingston. Yep, that, that's one way to get people to move. There were 137 men taken prisoner, and 80 of them were killed. But of course, these prisoners, they get a lawyer, John A. McDonald in Kingston, who, as it happens, became Canada's first prime minister. The Hunter's Lodge is infiltrating all levels of government. <laughs> Open your eyes, people. The snowshoes are everywhere. And the beavers. Gotta watch out for the beavers, man. There was also the Battle of Windsor. This was the final hunter attack that was planned, organized out of Cleveland. It had the attention of driving inland to London, which is in Upper Canada. They were also planning a diversionary attack from Port Huron on Sarnia, which was canceled because the British, they deployed on them. With a lot of men. Gentlemen, the war's off. Why? The enemy showed up. Exactly. So about five to six hundred men establishes a camp at Brest, which is 30 miles of Detroit. Lucius was in command of this camp. And he thought that there was not enough men for a successful attack. Now, Roberts, he said, we should attack anyway. And on December 3rd, they seize a steamboat called Champlain. And 135 men aboard landed three miles north of Windsor. They set fire to the barracks there at Windsor. You know, I'm beginning to think that uh, this is just a pyromaniacs club. <laughs> Burning stuff was very prevalent in these days. We've seen that in every single conflict up till now. I'm aware but it, those were militaries, not a bunch of guys playing weekend warrior and, you know, coming up with some funny little rituals to feel special. Now, they separate into three detachments under Cornelius Cunningham. We'll call him CC. William Putnam. We're just going to call him Putnam. And S.S. Coffinbury. We're going to call him Coffin. It and they set fire to the steamer Thomas, shouting, Remember the Caroline. <laughs> oh my goodness. Then they take up position in an apple orchard where they are attacked by the upper Canadian militia. 21 of them are killed and 24 arrested. Uh, Bierce and Roberts escape to Detroit and are joined by Dr. E.A. Feller, who had escaped imprisonment in Quebec. How'd he manage that? He chewed through the bars with his beaver teeth. <laughs> uh, nothing can stop the mighty hunter. He uses his beaver training. So, on the 4th of December, the reinforcements finally arrive. I think they're a little late. But the American government comes in and prevents a second attack. The Patriots, they hold a large public meeting where they passed resolutions rebuking the U.S. government for taking arms against its own people. I... The Volunteer Army then disperses and ends the Patriot War. Shame on you for taking up arms against us. Okay, we're done now. Bye. Let me guess. They weren't done. Oh, they were done. It's over. Now we're going to get into the aftermath. So, 93 Americans and 58 Canadian prisoners were transported to Australia after being convicted in Montreal at the end of 1838. Because that's where we sent our prisoners at this time. Oh, I mean, we don't. UK does. 93 of them were Americans. Doing crimes on British soil. So, they were transported by the HMS Buffalo. Did they burn it? <laughs> <laughs> and they arrive in February of 1840. The Americans got off at Hobart, but the Canadians were taken to Sydney. 
They were interned near the present-day suburb of Concord, giving rise to the name Canada Bay, French Bay, and Exile Bay. Now, the Canadians were treated better than the Americans. They were liberated sooner and were helped to get home. Now, the Americans, there were 93 of them, 14 died on the way over there and died while they were doing the hard labor over there in Australia. Now, by the end of 44, half of them had been granted pardons, and then another four years go by, and pretty much all of them were pardoned. Then the lat there was there was only five left, and they stayed there for another two years. So I mean, at, at the end of this, the rebellion was inspired by the exact same ideals that the American Revolutionary War, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the Irish Revolution, and Spanish Revolution. They had all those revolutions had the exact same ideals, mm-hmm. but. It did not end the same way all those other revolutions ended. So, being the U.S. Navy history podcast, did the Navy of uh, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario for the glorious Hunter's Lodge maritime power ever end up doing anything aside from sinking or burning? You know, the burning of Caroline. Remember the Caroline? Never forget. D.S. Steamship was damaged in the Battle of Windsor. Oh, no. So the connection is pretty much the Caroline Affair, Navy Island, the attack on the, with the schooner Anne, uh, Fighting Islands, Ickery Island, Pelly Island. So there's a little bit of boat, boat stuff in okay. there. Well, and it's an interesting part of, you know, United States and Canadian history that I'm sure a lot of people don't know about. Yeah. But that is going to be it for the Patriot War. I thought it was going to take more than that, but I was wrong. (laughs) What a splendid little war. Yeah. I mean, it only took a year. A year, some groceries, and a little fire. Looks like the Hunter's Lodge is actually defunct. Oh, but what's this? Uh... A club song? Oh, who can ever agree on a plan? Who runs away when crap hits the fan? We do. We do. Send in snowshoes to the front. Beavers gnawing through the bars. We do. We do. It goes on and on. A lot of fire is brought up. Yeah. Well, folks, what I think we learned today is if you're going to start a secret society... Don't immediately start planning a revolution. You know, actually build up your numbers and, you know, do a little bit of training first. And don't intend on invading arguably the strongest international power at the time. Start local, like the grocery store down the street. Take out your rival first. Actually, they did go local. All three powers that were involved were local. Well, yeah, yes. The Americans, the, the the Canadians, and the British. Yes, but by local I mean, you know, start start local, like small town. Don't don't poke the the largest uh, empire at the time. Well, I think that's going to be it for us. If you want to start a rebellion, you can contact the XO. <laughs> you can contact the XO at U.S. Navy History podcast at gmail.com or you could tweet at him at usn history pod and while he's arrested and jailed for treason we want to wish you fair winds and following seas captain i won't even be able to read those emails or tweets because you won't let me back in my room i'll shout them down to you in the bilge fine you know I, i'm just gonna be replying with obscenities see you later folks U.S. Naval History Podcast, departing. Departing.